I believe this is the eighth video in this series on the 101 most commonly misused GRE words, link in the description. But having glanced at a few of the words coming up today, I think this could be the best. There are a lot of great GRE words and just words for you to add into your vocabulary. I think you'll definitely learn something. If you get to the end of this list and you already knew every word and every distinction, then give yourself a star because your vocabulary is amazing. If not, you're definitely going to learn something. Let's deal with the first pair. Invey and inveil. Now, I knew inveil for a long time. To inveil against something, usually say against after the word, means to attack or moan or complain about something. He inveighed about the state of the economy. She inveighed about the state of modern politics. To complain about, to protest about, to really be angry against. I guess I'm just trying to think of a way of remembering that. Maybe like a horse neighs, you know, nay. Well, if you inveigh, you're kind of like protesting like a horse might. I don't know, that's not a very good one, but it might help you to, to learn. In Vail, I didn't know for many years, and only in the last couple of years have I kind of added that word into my vocabulary. And to inveil is to put a veil over someone's eyes, to trick someone or coerce them, influence them to do something that they might not have otherwise done, to beguile someone, to convince someone, maybe in not the most honest, straightforward way. You're putting a veil, you're blinding someone's eyes. You're inveiling them to do something. To persuade, to cajole, to convince someone to do something, maybe with flattery or other forms of deceit. And that's the difference between inveil to complain and inveil to persuade using deception. Insidious and invidious. Insidious means something that seems lovely, but is actually bad. It's seeping inside a system or a person because it seems attractive, but actually that's deceptive. It's actually bad for you. It's harmful. That's how you might remember it. It's seeping inside, but it's odious. It's bad for you, but it got inside because it's attractive. You might say using drugs is insidious. Attractive at first, but then harmful over time. Invidious is a word, again, like in veil, that I didn't know for many years, and I'm only about 95% confident I fully understood the word. So I'm going to check my definition against what they say. But I would say invidious means an uncomfortable position to be in because you've really got there by wrong means. So for example, if someone appointed their son to be the manager of their company, that would be an invidious position. Unfair, because the position was gained through nepotism, through having a family link, and also uncomfortable and awkward for that son, because everyone else will be thinking, oh, this is so unfair. The most common way this word is used is to say, oh, they put me in an invidious position, where you might be uncomfortable, feeling awkward, where other people might resent you for the position you're in. So they do say that Invidious means prejudiced or showing partiality. The juror was obviously invidious towards the plaintiff. But honestly speaking, even though that is one of the definitions, I think the other definition of being uncomfortable because you might cause resentment among others is more commonly used actually nowadays. So I'm actually going to show you that definition on Google because the definition here I don't think really conveys all of that. So let's see if we can find invidious. Yeah, here we go. The first definition of an action or situation likely to arouse or incur resentment or anger in others. It's an unpleasant, difficult, undesirable, unenviable position. Yes, that you got because of prejudice, it being unfair, but it's also carrying the connotation of causing yourself and others awkwardness and unpleasantness. So that's a great word there, invidious. And there are similarities with insidious, but they are fundamentally different words. Okay, insight and insight. These are very, very different words. To incite something is to incite a riot, to 
to incite a mob to cause an action to come about, usually a bad action. His words incited her to do something very bad. Or the politician's words incited a riot. To urge something, to cause something, as they say, but usually a bad thing. Whereas insight is totally different. Think of it as having sight. You're having vision above other people. To gain an insight into something is to gain a perspective on something. To have an idea or an understanding of something that maybe a lot of other people don't have. As they say, a deep perception. It's a highly praising word. If you say someone's got great insights, it means they have great ideas, great real knowledge and awareness of the situation. Or I want to learn from you and gain an insight into your industry. Like a real perspective on it from a respected figure. An intelligent perspective on something. Very different words with very different connotations. One negative, insight. One positive, insight. Even pronounced slightly differently. Insight on the left. Insight on the right. Necessary versus essential. Now, at first sight, they mean the same thing. If something is necessary, you have to have it. If something is essential, you have to have it. But necessary is a functional word. It's necessary that we do this. There's no smile on your face when you're using the word necessary. It's just a formal word. It's necessary, as they say, that you take this medicine every day. But if I really want to teach you something interesting, it would be the word essential also carries a slightly positive connotation. So let's talk about a restaurant, for example. You might say it is necessary for the restaurant to pay its rent. Because you wouldn't really say that with a smile. You just say that's something we have to do, okay? And you can say, yes, it's essential that the restaurant pay its rent. But you're just as likely to say something positive, like the chef is the essence of the restaurant. Or the chef is essential to the restaurant. It's the heart of the restaurant. Both paying the rent and having a chef are necessary. But one, the word essential, more carries the connotation of that's the beating heart of the thing itself. That's the true essence of what we're talking about. A chef is essential to a restaurant. It's its essence. As they say, essential means fundamental. Water is an essential part of our life. And you see, you could say that sentence with almost a little bit of a smile on your face because you're praising something almost. Whereas necessary is necessarily almost a bit more functional and formal. I hope I've conveyed some of the difference there. A seed and exceed. I'll be honest, a seed is a rarer word now, and you mainly hear it about coming onto the throne of a monarch. She acceded to the throne. Or sometimes it could be a business, he acceded into his position as CEO. It means not really be promoted, but to elevate up to the next position, to accede into a role or responsibility. Now they say it means to allow or agree. She acceded to his demands, but that definition is not used too commonly. You'd basically say agree now. Some of these words I think are brilliant additions to your vocab, but using the word accede to mean agree is, I don't know, not terribly common anymore. I guess you could use it specifically if someone is like blackmailing or really demanding something with a ransom or something, and then you might say he acceded to her demands. So in that sense, it could still be used, but most commonly accede means to gain a position like the crown, head of state or something. Exceed is of course extremely common. To exceed means to go over the limit of something. To exceed your overdraft, you've borrowed too much money from the bank and you've gone over your overdraft. Exceed is just like in maths, to be greater than. One thing to be greater than the other. As they say, I hope you exceed my expectations. That's a common idiom. To exceed one's expectations is to be even better than what you expected. Two very different words. One quite rare, one quite common. Now this is a great pair here. Meretricious and meritorious. The way I remember meretricious is that you see the first five letters. It almost looks like merit, but there's a, an extra E in there. 
And that's how I remember it. It looks like it's got merit on the surface, but it's actually awful. Like imagine a gold coin, but it's actually just made of, I don't know, not chocolate even, I don't know, vegetables or something. Like it looks like it might be worth something, but it's actually rubbish. Or more commonly used about people or arguments, it seems really nice and fancy, but it's actually terrible. Someone's wearing an amazing suit, but it's actually maybe rented for $5 from a friend. It's a bit meretricious. Or most commonly of all, describing a personality, very flashy, gaudy, over the top, but actually there's no substance there. And how do we remember it again? Because the first five letters almost look like merit. It almost has got merit, which remember means like quality and accomplishment. It's misspelled. It's merit with two E's. And so it doesn't have any merits. It's meritricious. What a contrast then with the word meritorious, which means having merit or, or good quality because they've spelt merit correctly. You've got merit, M-E-R-I-T at the beginning. So you can remember that meritorious actually means having merit, whereas meretricious, because it's misspelled at the beginning, means flashy but no merit. I think that's a brilliant way of remembering the difference. Please do leave a like and a comment if you like that one. Okay, militate and mitigate. Militate is definitely not a common uh, word and I basically never use it. I only just about know it. To militate against something, I believe, means to act or forcibly object to something. To militate against something, again, almost always with the word against after, means to oppose or resist something. Almost like a military might resist a takeover. To militate against something is to almost be very forceful and determined against something, like you're a kind of military. Pretty much always in the negative, to militate against, to oppose something. What do they say? Militate is a verb and means to influence forcefully. Politeness has been militated against his opinions. Forcefully used against his opinions? Okay, I'm gonna check with Google again because I don't think that's a great definition. Let's do dictionary.com because that's the one I use. Militate. I always thought it was always against. Let's see what it says here. Usually followed by against. There you go. Or militate for. Oh, okay. So you can be in favor of something. Against or for. So militate against, militate for. To have influence or effect, the evidence militated against his release. Oh, okay. So it can be for or against. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I think it's more commonly used against something. The example has against, but you can militate for something, like really push for something. Either way, it's to be forceful, like a military. Mitigate is much more common, and it means to reduce the severity of something. To mitigate climate change means to reduce its effects. You not remove it, just make it a little bit better. Let me mitigate the situation by giving you both a £10 note. Or let me mitigate this argument by telling you that you're both wonderful and you both have good points. You're just making something less severe, calming it down a little bit. As they say, the circumstances have somehow mitigated the crime he could have committed. So it would have been a worse crime, but the circumstances have reduced it, made it a bit less severe. Still bad, but just not as bad. Militate, not a common word. Mitigate, very common word. Prodigy and protege, both very common. Interesting how to pronounce. Prodigy, fairly obvious. Protege, I think it's French, presumably, but that's how you pronounce it. Prodigy basically means someone who is exceptional in their field. You often hear the word child prodigy, someone who is amazing in their field at a young age. I think Magnus Carlsen was 13 years old when he became a grandmaster or when he beat Kasparov. So that's a prodigy, someone who is incredibly talented, as they say, and young. That's, I guess, just included in the word itself. As a bonus word, you also have prodigious, which means of exceptional extent. He has a prodigious amount of money, a huge amount of money, just like a prodigy has a huge amount of talent. A protege is basically like an apprentice that you're working on 
kind of exclusively to bring them up. So maybe you have a talented musician, a prodigy, let's say, and they have a young sidekick and they're the prodigy's protege, basically someone they're trying to bring up to maybe one day be of the same status as them. Basically like an apprentice, a sidekick that you're trying to bring up to the same level as you, but presuming that you are incredibly talented in that area too. You can't have a protege if you're rubbish. You've got to be great, you've got to have talent, and you're bringing up your protege to see if they can be as good as you one day. Let's see what they say. Protege is a noun that means a person who trains under a skilled or influential coach. The youngster was an aide and protege of the former senator of state. So the senator had the power and the prestige, and the youngster was an aide, a protege, so that one day, if the senator can pass on their skills, such as they have, the aide can maybe one day become a senator too. Okay, reluctant and reticent. Commonly confused, but subtly different. To be reluctant, I think most of you would know, means you just don't want to do something. You're not totally against it, you're just, you're not keen on it. You'd really rather not do it. You are reluctant. And reticent might seem the same, but reticent is more general. It means shy, quietly spoken, not wanting to say too much. So yes, a reticent person is usually reluctant to speak too much, but it's broader than that. So you can be reluctant about a specific thing, but not be a reticent person. Whereas a reticent person is quite shy and retiring in general. Okay, some controversy here, because they're saying they're agreeing with reluctant, means unwilling to do something, but reticent means unemotional. Hmm, I don't really associate it with that. I associate it with just being shy and unforthcoming. The reticent criminal, I guess not wanting to say too much, was punished severely by the jailer. I don't really think unemotional is the best way to say it. I'm gonna to have to look this one up. So let me go across again to dictionary.com and do reticent. There you go. Disposed to be silent or not to speak freely. Reserved, kind of like shy, reluctant or restrained. And they say beneath, synonyms would be taciturn, quiet, uncommunicative. Yeah, I don't think unemotional is the best way of saying that. It's more just quiet, reserved. Anyway, you can see slightly different from reluctant, worth knowing the difference. And finally, we have this extravaganza. Voracious, vociferous, and voracious. Like, did I pronounce that right? Voracious, vociferous, and voracious. Slightly different there. Voracious is a simple one. It means truthful, accurate, full of verity, which means truth. The actual word very, I don't know if you know this, means or comes from verily, which means truthfully. That's what people used to say. Verily, I tell you. Truthfully, I tell you. But now we just say very. I'm very sure rather than I'm verily. I'm truthfully sure. We just say very. Well, from that same origin, we have voracious, full of truth and accurate. As they say, it was a voracious account of his attitude, an accurate one. Vociferous almost looks like it's using the same letters as voice, and that's accurate because vociferous means being very loud, using your voice a lot to be vociferous. As they say, it means very loud. The vociferous mob was silenced by the police. And finally, voracious means greedy, all-consuming. Often you have it with the phrase, a voracious appetite. You just can't help yourself, you just eat, eat, eat. Or a voracious consumer of news. You're just constantly gobbling up the news that you want to read. They say it means greedy. The voracious businessman met the fate he deserved, jail. I guess that means greedy in his business dealings. Voracious doesn't necessarily have to be negative. As I say, you can have a voracious appetite for information. You're just consuming all the information you can. I hope that's clarified the difference between those three awesome words. And I hope you agree that this list was probably the most exciting in terms of new and interesting words. Either way, please do let me know if you learn any new words and I shall see you soon.